This is Our Haunted Planet. A book by John A. Keel. In this book, John A. Keel brings into chilling focus, strange truths about the Earth and its mysterious inhabitants. Could an unseen, pre-human race have taken careful measures to remain hidden, from surface dwellers? Are they still watching us from their secret hiding places, manipulating and misleading us, using us for their own entertainment, and controlling our actions? Our Haunted Planet is an entertaining survey of anomalous Fortean events such as UFOs, enigmatic stone monuments, men in black, missing ships and aircrafts, phantom radio broadcasts, teleportation, missing time, black magic, tulpas, angels, demigods, tricksters, and much more. If you like to learn about weird stuff, you just found the right book. This book is full of things you probably never heard of. The stuff that the mainstream media will not touch. The introduction. In September 1953, I spent eight hours inside the Great Pyramid in Egypt producing a radio program which was aired throughout Europe over the American Forces Network, AFN, the following month. Egypt so impressed me, and archaeology so fascinated me, that I returned to Cairo the next year and lived there for several months, wading through the musty libraries and museums, prowling the desert, and visiting the ancient tombs. During a trek to Aswan and the Upper Nile I saw my first flying saucer, a metallic-looking disc, with a rotating outer rim, which hovered for several minutes above the Aswan Dam in broad daylight. I had written and produced a radio documentary, Things in the Sky, in 1952, and my earlier researches into unidentified flying objects had already convinced me that such things not only existed, but that they had been present in our skies since the dawn of man. Eventually my travels took me to Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad and a thousand places in between. I walked among the ancient ruins and puzzled over man's illustrious but forgotten past. In India I wandered alone into the Himalayas and crossed the border of Tibet, which has since been sealed by the Chinese. As I traveled, I interviewed archaeologists, historians, and assorted experts and spent endless hours in remote libraries poring over rare old books. I was puzzled at first to discover that none of the leading authorities seemed to agree on anything. Indeed, a large part of the scientific literature is devoted to theorization and incredibly vicious attacks on the theories of other theorists. Most perplexing of all was the fact that some of the literature about the ruins I had visited smacked of pure fiction, because the authors had not visited the sites but labored instead to couple fictitious theories with dubious facts. This led, of course, to conclusions that bordered on the imbecilic. An offshoot of this process is, understandably enough, an enornegation mouse quantity of crank literature created by unqualified researchers who attempted to interpret the scientific material in their own ways. In many areas of the less popular sciences the crank material outnegation weighs the scientific because few if any scientists have tackled those subjects. So 98% of all the available literature on Atlantis, flying saucers, Tibet, and prehistoric ruins falls into the crank cat negation agori, the task of sorting all this out and developing a valid sin negation thesis is a formidable one, one which have undertaken with great trepidation. In his book, in the name of science, Martin Gardner defines the characteristics of the common crank or pseudoscientist. He lists the four chief attributes as being, 1, the crank considers himself a genius, even a towering genius who is years ahead of hit time. 2, he considers his colleagues and fellow researchers ignorant block negation heads, largely because they fail to recognize his genius. He assaults his opponents by impugnation, questioning their honesty, intelligation gents, and motives. They respond in kind, naturally, and so great storms are whipped up in the trivial teacups of the scientific and pseudoscientific journals. Controversy is the lifeblood of crankism. 3. The pseudoscientist is paranoid and feels he is the victim of a vast conspiracy designed to suppress his brilliant work. In many instances these imagined conspiracies become a vital part of the subject itself, as for example, the endless literature discussing how the U.S. Air Force has been keeping the truth about flying saucers from the public. 4. The crank delights in focusing his attacks on the greatest scientists and the best established theories. He goes after big game. He is wiser than Einstein, 
knows more about astronegation only than Fred Hoyle, and is better informed about the moon than Neil Armstrong. The crank also invents his own terminology, a Jabberwocky understood only by him and his closest allies. So, we find the litter negation to a filled with confusing and complicated terms which are merely displays of pseudo-erudition, or what psychiatrists call neologisms. Over the years I have met the leaders of many peculiar cults and pseudo-scientific factions of belief. With very few exceptions, they have all lived up to the above criteria. Most were friendly and co-negation operative with me until they realized that I did not share their beliefs in Atlantis or visitors from Andromeda. Then they turned on me with wrathful vengeance and launched such campaigns of a negation-founded slander that one could only be amazed and amused. I have now been accused of being everything from a communist conman to a secret agent for the Central Intelligence Agency, from a religious fanatic, I'm a lifelong agnostic, to a pawn of the devil. Typo negation graphical errors, over which I have no control, in my many articles and books have been lovingly dissected by these groups and prompted countless letters and essays reviewing their sinister negation placations. After 25 years as a writer and reporter dedicated to collecting the facts as objectively and as honestly as possible, my integrity has been attacked from all angles. For these reasons this book is written in a style which discusses known facts with the popular and unpopular beliefs they have in negation inspired. I am not supporting any of these beliefs. I am merely disnegation cussing them. It may be that the great civilizations Oif Atlantis and Lemuria once actually flourished on this planet. In this book I am only weighing the evidence pro and con. It may be that little green men from Mars really are visiting housewives in Nebraska. I am only reporting the claims of the housewives, not trying to prove that Martians are really dropping in. The believers in Atlantis will unnegation undoubtedly hate me. The believers in Martians already despise me. Parts of this book are so obviously tongue-in-cheek that it shouldn't be necessary to mention it, yet I know from bitter experience negation and that some of my humorous comments will be taken seriously and will prompt new venom. I am not attacking any specific indie negation visuals or cults. I am attacking man's abysmal ignorance and his impassioned effort to hide that ignorance from himself. I have seen a large part of this world and its mysteries. Wonder and curiosity have always been an integral part of my life. I am only trying to share that wonder with the reader. This book is based upon countless interviews, endless correspond negation dents, many in-depth personal investigations, and hundreds of books covering everything from alchemy to zoology. Wherever post negation cible, I have tried to include key source references for the benefit of those readers who might be interested in pursuing some of these matters further. It has been impossible, however, to list all my sources. Some of the hooks used in my research were privately pub negation list and are quite rare. But even some of these can be obtained through Gray Barker, Box 2228, Clarksburg, West Virginia 26301, and Health Research, 70 Lafayette Street, McCullumney Hill, California 95245, Although unidentified flying objects are mentioned frequently in these pages, the UFO controversy is not the main theme. Some of the major UFO cases discussed are drawn from reports which appeared originally in England's Flying Saucer Review, the only truly scientific publication devoted to the subject. Queries should be directed to Flying Saucer Review, 49A Kings Grove, London SC15, England, I do not pretend to know any answers. After a lifetime of travel and study I am still learning the questions. This is a journey into man's past and the curious manifestations which have always sore negation rounded him and which have directed the human race upwards from the caves to the moon itself. It is a journey into a jungle of myth, legend, and belief, and hopefully, it is another small step towards the larger truth that man has always sought but never really found. Knowledge is power. Don't let anyone tell you how to think. Don't be left in the dark. Yours truthfully, John A. Keel, Chapter 1. You can't get there from here. While hairy, beetle-browed cavemen were laboring to invent fire and the wheel, there already existed on this planet a highly developed civilization of intelligent beings. They built massive cities of stone, many of which are still standing. They methodically constructed giant mounds of earth all over this planet for some purpose which still escapes us. 
They scattered peculiar artifacts of stone and metal across every continent, and they sailed every ocean, mapping the entire globe systematically. Then they vanished. Cavemen inherited the earth. They regarded the ancient cities as sacred places. As the centuries ticked off, they became conscious of other life forms around them. Life forms that seemed to possess the power of invisibility, of life and death itself. They invented names for these forms. They worshipped them. They recorded the manifestations of that invisible world in myths and legends handed down from generation to generation. Eventually they perfected sciences. Based upon their observations of those manifestations. In time those sciences developed new myths. The original owners of the earth, the builders of those great cities, were forgotten. But as men spread across the face of the planet, the traces of those lost elders were rediscovered. Man's newfangled sciences couldn't fit such traces into their new concepts, however, so the evidence was ignored. As a result, the earth has two histories, the history taught in our colleges and schools, and the real but ignored history of a very ancient people and of strange forces which have often supervised human events. Ten thousand years ago that I unknown civilization carefully mapped the entire surface of the globe. Their maps were copied and recopied and passed along from one age to the next. Finally, copies of them were rediscovered by Captain Arlington H. Mallory in, of all places, the Library of Congress. Known as the Peary Race Maps, they were originally found among the relics in the former Imperial Palace of the Sultan of Constantinople in 1929. Eventually they ended up in the archives in Washington, D.C. At first glance these maps, which are dated A.D. 1513, appear to be nothing more than a hopelessly garbled view of the ancient world. No one paid much attention to them until Captain Mallory came along. Working with the U.S. Hydrographic Office and the Weston Observatory of Boston, he developed a grid system which suddenly brought the maps into focus. The modern Mercator grid system was not invented until 1559, so the ancient surveyors had to develop a method of their own. Once Mallory had unscrambled that method, he could hardly believe the results. These maps were incredibly detailed and as accurate as the latest charts. Antarctica, for example, was not discovered until Captain Cook reached it in 1773, and it was not fully explored until the 1950s, but the frozen continent is laid out with almost pinpoint accuracy on the Peary race maps, including mountain ranges that were not even known to us until 19,521 even more astonishing, these maps outline glaciers and land areas which are known to have existed in the Ice Age, before the last great shift of the Earth's crust and estimated 10,000 years ago. This fact led Mallory to conclude that the original on which the Peary race maps were apparently based had to have been drawn before the Ice Age. Professor Charles Hapgood, a science historian, heard of Mallory's work and turned the maps into a class study project at Keene State College. His students painstakingly compared each detail with modern charts and found that the ancient maps were never more than five degrees off, and those errors were probably due to land movements that occurred after the originals were drawn. Many of the details of the early maps correlated precisely with modern surveys. The results of Hapgood's studies, together with full-color reproductions of the maps, were published in a took titled Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Modem scientists can't seem to agree on the age of mankind. Each year produces a new bit of bone and new controversy. Some claim man might be half a million years old. Others offer more conservative estimates ranging between 30 to 70,000 years. But all seem to share the notion that our ancestors were embarrassingly primitive 10,000 years ago. They certainly were not developed enough to sail and chart the earth. It would have been impossible for anyone to contrive the maps in 1929, the year they were found in Constantinople. It would have been even more impossible for someone to hoax them in 1513. And it is downright ridiculous to think that someone could have surveyed the earth before the Ice Age. Modem scientists have a very scientific method for coping with such humiliating discoveries. They put them in the basements of their museums and forget them. The museums are filled with such erratics, as they are called. A cube of metal, carefully machined, notched, and rounded on one side, was found in the center of a block of coal in Austria in 1885. It's still in a museum in Salzburg and no one has ever come up with an explanation for it. 
Basing their conclusions on the age of the coal bed, various experts have estimated it to be 300,000 years old. That makes it quite a bit younger than the piece of gold thread that workmen found embedded in 8 feet of rock at a quarry in Rutherford Mills, England. The London Times announced the discovery on June 22, 1844, and the experts mumbled that it had to be 60 million years old. Who could have dropped a gold thread in England 60 million years ago? Or who could have manufactured that iron and nickel cube 300,000 years back? Maybe these things were the handiwork of the same people who made the strange pieces of very ancient pottery which have been found in rock quarries and coal mines around the world along with steel nails, perfect glass lenses, and even, believe it or not, bones of prehistoric animals with bullets in them. Giant chains have been found embedded in great rocks in both North and South America. Not merely embedded but actually passing through the rocks. They seem to predate the arrival of the Europeans by thousands of years. Electric batteries have been found in ancient Egyptian tombs. A huge slab of perfect green glass weighing many tons was found in a cave in Israel a few years ago. It ranks as the largest piece of glass ever cast and is very ancient. Who made it, how, and why are still unsolved mysteries? Science tells us one thing, these artifacts put the lie to all the scientific theories. Take man's earliest records, the cave paintings. Scientists assert that the great Saurians were extinct long before man arrived on the scene. Yet cave paintings have been found depicting dinosaurs. Other cliff carvings in the southwest show men hurling weapons at gigantic creatures that look like elephants or mammoths. Captain Mallory created a stir when he first revealed his work with the Peary race maps on a broadcast from Georgetown University in 1956. He dared to suggest that the maps may have been the product of an aerial survey. Professor Hapgood was more cautious, however, and merely implied they were the work of some lost seafaring culture. The aerial survey hypothesis would have necessarily been dependent upon a highly advanced technological society. Not only would flying machines have been required, but photography would also be needed for such a survey. Did the elders have cameras, too? A mere 47,000 years ago somebody carved an intriguing picture on the side of the Hunan Mountains in China. A picked touré of cylinders in the sky with strange beings standing on them. Russian and Chinese archaeologists could date it, but they couldn't explain it. Nor could they explain the drawing they found carved in a cliff at Fergana in Central Asia in 1961. A Reuters dispatch described it as resembling a man wearing an airtight helmet with some kind of mechanical contraption on his back. It has been dated at 7000 BC other peculiar cave and cliff carvings have been found in South America, Japan, and the Sahara Desert. Some of these pictures show giants with round heads towering over ordinary hunters. Others depict circular objects with, odd creatures coming out of them. These drawings were apparent. Attempts to record highly unusual and significant events, but today they are open to all kinds of interpretation and speculation. Scattered throughout France there are many ancient caverns heavily decorated with carvings and paintings de-otting back 10 to 30,000 years. More than 2,000 animals are depicted, including 610 horses, 510 bison, 205 mammoths, and 176 ibex according to a study published by H. Broy in 1952. Alongside this impressive menagerie there are scores of other designs which are far more mysterious. They show oval and disc-shaped objects some apparently standing on tripod legs with ladders extending down from them. Archaeologists can't account for them, but they look uneasily like the modem descriptions of flying saucers. The leading French authority, Aimé Michel, goes so far as to suggest that that is exactly what they are. Ancient records in China describe flying saucers and mysterious lights in the sky. They were usually regarded as dragons, and the early Chinese noted that these things flew regular routes year after year, century after century. Other early manuscripts preserved in India mention vimanas, aerial cars, as if they were commonplace. 5,000 years ago a sage named Maharishi Bharadwaj wrote a thorough description of these vimanas telling how they could move in all directions silently, cover vast distances, and even become invisible. They were supposedly propelled by tunes and rhythms. Perhaps a poetic way of describing the humming and whirring of intricate and little understood machinery. 
In appearance they resembled the flying cones which have been frequently described in the reports of modem UFO witnesses around the globe. Although this sort of evidence is superabundant, it has never been systematically studied by trained scholars. Instead, this material has fallen into the hands of assorted cultists and students of fringe pseudosciences. It has been used to advance belief in everything from lost Atlantis to extraterrestrial visitants from some distant planet. To subscribe to any one of these multitudinous beliefs is to exclude all other possibilities. We should consider every possibility, avoid belief, and accept only the hard facts. Two key facts are already clear, one, there have always been strange objects in the skies above this planet. They were seen by early man and have been seen constantly ever since, as the Bible and other available records still firmly attest. Two, somebody mapped the earth before the ice age. We have no way of knowing who they were or how they did it. If the Peary race maps were the product of an aerial survey, then perhaps there was an advanced civilization somewhere in the Americas or the Pacific, removed from the random clusters of primitive men. But occasionally the advanced culture dropped in on the cavemen or at least flew overhead. Thus, two cultures may have existed simultaneously. One highly advanced and purposely aloof from the other, the animal-like cave dwellers. It was inevitable that the two cultures should occasionally cross and that the higher group should affect the lower in many ways. At some point in early history the higher culture was either destroyed by a monumental catastrophe or withdrew in some fashion, leaving hardly a trace behind. So, our entire record of that superculture comes from the observations of primitive man, our only evidence is the flimsy overlapping that took place, the residue of the effect of the superculture upon the subculture. Primitive man was profoundly influenced by the superculture and guided by it. There are even indications that members of the superculture actually appeared before primitive man and took over as kings and god kings to direct his early development. Such appearances helped to generate many of man's first religious beliefs. Some 2,500,000 people believe in the Book of Mormon, the Mormon Bible, which is purportedly a record of life in North America thousands of years ago. As with all such records from all cultures and all religions, there are frequent descriptions of events in which some unknown benevolent group supplied man with direct help in an hour of need. For example, here is how a compass was introduced, presumably, to those long-forgotten North Americans, and it came to pass that as my father arose in the morning and went forth to the tent door, to his great astonishment he beheld upon the ground a round ball of curious workmanship, and it was a fine brass. And within the ball were two spindles, and the one pointed the way whither we should go into the wilderness. 1 Nephi 1610, one of the most popular theories bandied about in cultist circles is that man was seated on this planet by some interplanetary group and that that group has kindly, but remotely, observed and guided our progress ever since. If this were true, they have been doing a lousy job in recent centuries. We need a lot more help than they have been giving us. In H.G. Wells' prophetic things to come there is a vision of a world ravaged by war and divided into fierce tribes ruled by warlords. A handful of surviving scientists and thinkers band together and begin the task of restoring civilization by flying over the planet. They call their organization Wings Over the World, W.O.W. Much of the UFO evidence suggests that a real WOW has always existed. Maybe one of their members handed a caveman the first flaming brand and the first wheel, just as some unknown party allegedly deposited the first compass outside that Mormon tent. A friend from Wow could have handed the original pen race map to some ancient Egyptian. After him it may have passed from the library at Alexandria to the palace in Constantinople. The key to the grid system was lost, so the map became useless. However, it is known that Christopher Columbus did have some strange maps when he set out for his shortcut to India. One it is easy to speculate and even easier to leap to mind-blowing conclusions. We must try instead to assemble the many fragments of tantalizing evidence and attempt to construct the whole. To do this, we must first recognize some very unpleasant facts. We must admit just how stupid we really are. In recent months several different scientists attached to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, 
have issued humble public statements admitting that our space program has produced data which invalidates many of the most coveted conclusions and beliefs of our learned astronomers. Ideas which have been accepted as fact for many years have suddenly been proved completely false. The more we find out about the moon, the less we want see Arlington H. Mallory. Lost America. Know about it. Space probes to Mars and Venus have tossed innumerable astronomical theories into a cocked hat. Recent radar probes to the planet Mercury discovered that that planet is actually rotating slowly on its axis, even though millions of school children have been taught for generations that Mercury does not rotate. Leading astronomers are now arguing over the status of Jupiter. Some now suspect that it isn't a planet at all but is really a cold star. For the past two centuries astronomers have been peering through telescopes, counting stars, and making mathematical calculations to account for the motions and flickerings they have observed. They have published and taught their learned conclusions as the gospel. Now we know that they have been wrong in many key areas. Before the end of this century all the textbooks will have to be scrapped. All of the old ideas will be discarded. We used to think of the universe as nothing more than abundant fields of stars arranged in galaxies, Dr. Frank Drake, chairman of Cornell University's astronomy department, said recently. But we underestimated the variety and quantity of matter in space by a factor of about one trillion. Which means that we were about as wrong as we could be. In the early 1960s deep dish radio telescopes discovered a maze of radio signals pouring in from outer space. At first there were wild speculations that we had made contact with some super civilizations in some other galaxy. But further study discounted this fascinating notion. Instead, it was found that interstellar space is filled with invisible objects which don't emit light rays but which do give off powerful radio waves. These things have been dubbed quasars and pulsars. They constitute one rather trivial aspect of a broad and complex phenomenon. Our haunted planet has always been bathed in mysterious electromagnetic propagation and radio waves, some of them intelligent signals of unknown origin. We have been aware of these signals ever since the invention of the radio receiver, but we still can't account for them. All of this will be discussed in depth in another chapter. Just as those funny flying saucers seem to be an environmental mystery which has always existed on this planet, it also seems that the Earth's atmosphere has always been charged with unidentified radio signals, some of which seem to radiate from the planet itself, as if the Earth were beaming signals into space in response to the signals being received. Of course, the cultists contend that WoW has established secret transmitters in underground caverns. Even gravity is a mystery. Newton discovered the hard way that if you sit under an apple tree, you are apt to get hit on the head by a falling apple. But we still don't know why, recent experiments indicate that gravity is really a slowly pulsing wave pouring across space, beating about once per hour. The source of this wave and its true nature are a puzzle. We thought we knew something about it until our astronauts went into space and fumbled around in weightlessness. They found that even friction disappears in space, Buckminster Fuller, the great thinker and designer, has said. Everything you've learned in school is obvious becomes less and less obvious as you begin to study the universe. For example, there are no solids in the universe. There's not even a suggestion of a solid. There are no absolute continuums. There are no surfaces. There are no straight lines. Everything is up for grabs. We don't know anything about the umverse or outer space. We have in all likelihood constructed a totally false history of our own race. And most humiliating of all, although we have lived on this planet for at least 40,000 years, we really don't know much about it. Worse still, we haven't even explored it. Vast sections of this planet encompassing hundreds of thousands of square miles have never been surveyed. There are enormous regions that still have not been visited by a single scientifically trained man. Seasoned travelers are wearily familiar with the problem of locating accurate maps. In many countries in Africa, Asia, and South America detailed maps are simply unobtainable because no surveys have ever been made. Those maps which are available often have the rivers and mountains in the wrong places. Here in the United States precisely detailed maps of many areas just don't exist. There are blank spots in Maine and even in New Jersey. 
The average road map doled out by service stations includes only the major highways and the larger towns. Unincorporated villages, and they number in the thousands, can't be found on any map anywhere the regional maps distributed by the Geological Survey in Washington are often based upon surveys made in 1880 or 1920, so many of them are virtually useless. New highways are being built so rapidly that the average road map is two to five years behind. Travelers to inland Brazil find themselves trying to cope with maps based on sketches drawn by missionaries a hundred years ago. Visitors to the Himalaya mountains have to deal with maps drawn by amateur cartographers and guesswork. Vast sections of the Earth's oceans have not been adequately charted. There are countless islands everywhere that have never been visited, named, or mapped. If while actually exists, they could occupy a large island in the Pacific or Antarctica and nobody would ever be the wiser. We have, of course, flown over a great part of the Earth. Back in the 1930s Charles Lindbergh flew over Brazil and reported seeing an enormous stone wall deep in the jungle. A wall that stretched for miles. No explorer has ever penetrated to that wall over land. We still don't know anything about it, other flyers in other parts of the world have reported similar oddities and most of them remain unexplored mysteries. In 1970 the United Nations issued a report which stated that four-fifths of the Earth's surface was inadequately surveyed and charted and that tremendous areas remain unexplored altogether. The cartographers who drew up the original pen race maps probably knew more about our planet than we do. Despite all these facts, most of us like to pretend that our planet is fully explored and that all of its many mysteries have been adequately solved. We believe our history books. In fact, Many millions of people still cling to the thoroughly discredited religious belief that mankind is only 4,000 years old. Science labors to ignore the mounting evidence that we may not be the only intelligent life form on this planet. Yet historians have always carefully recorded the events which indicate that a par human race does exist alongside us. Millions of people have encountered them and thousands of books have been written about those encounters. Now that we are zooming headlong into the age of Aquarius, it is time for us to take a new look at the world around us, time for us to study those despicable erratics of archaeology and history, time for us to think about the unthinkable. Our much-touted technology has led us down the road to ruin, poisoned our environment, and given us the implements for destroying the earth itself. If there was a great superculture thousands of years ago, perhaps it followed the same tragic course. Perhaps even the abominable snowmen of the Himalayas and their North American counterparts, the Sasquatch of Canada, will inherit the earth, and 10,000 years from now their descendants will be studying a frayed copy of an old road map and speculating about us. Naturally, there will be scientists among them who will sneer at the whole thing, and they will get back to the business of trying to split the atom. Chapter 2. The Continent That Vanished. Every two or three years, some adventurous scientist or peripatetic deep-sea diver discovers lost Atlantis. He usually announces his find during the summer silly season when news is slow, and the papers are filled with yarns about the Loch Ness Monster and bathing beauty contests. Atlantis has now been located in the Mediterranean, many times, west of the Azores, south of the Azores, in the Caribbean, off the west coast of South America, off the east coast of South America, in the North Pacific, in the South Pacific, off the coast of Florida, and even in the Indian Ocean. Recently the ruins of an ancient temple of unknown origin were discovered in the blue waters off the Bahamas. The newspapers soberly revealed that Atlantis had been found at last. A year or so later a mysterious stone pillar was spotted by divers deep in the ocean off the coast of Peru. Atlantis rose again. This game has been going on for a very long time. Researchers wading through 50-year-old newspapers have found them sprinkled with wondrous tales of Atlantean finds. Professors and PhDs have frequently joined the clamor, bidding for publicity, and the often sizable foundation grants that follow such publicity, keeping alive one of the great fantasies of human history. It isn't even a myth or legend, there isn't enough evidence of any kind to give Atlantis such stature. Nevertheless, Atlantis has become an import and part of our folklore. Even the famous prophet Edgar Cayce discussed the lost continent with the spirit world and passed along the prediction that it would rise again in the stormy Atlantic in 1968-9. to 9. 
While the reality of Atlantis can be viewed with considerable skepticism, the persistence of the belief in it provides some interesting facts about the weird mechanisms employed by the Earth's phantom inhabitants to generate myths and camouflage their real existence. Atlantis is no more real than visitors from Mars. Tit there are millions of people who have believed wholeheartedly in both. The members of WoW have carefully sowed the seeds of such myths in their wake and have worked across the generations to nurture them. First, how did the story of Atlantis begin? It was launched by a single man named Plato, 427-347 BC. In his two dialogues Timaeus and Critias, he offers a description of Atlantis and its demise 9,000 years earlier. His source, he states, is a man named Curtius, who had heard the story from his great-grandfather Dropides, who had heard it from a sage named Solon, who had heard it from an Egyptian priest. So the whole foundation of the Atlantis fantasy is based upon what a 90-year-old man told a 10-year-old boy, those are the ages given by Plato, about a tale spun by Solon years before. Rather like having your great-grandfather tell you the plot of a novel that someone else described to him after having heard it from someone else in a far-off land, and that someone else hadn't read the novel but had only heard about it, since the novel was 9,000 years old. Incidentally, the final pages of Plato's discourse are missing, so even his record of this hearsay is incomplete. Scholars have devoted their lives to pondering Plato and searching for archaeological evidence to support the existence of Atlantis. Visit any library and you will find shelves of hooks on the subject. New pro-Atlantis volumes appear each year. A small, unfatigable cult of Atlantean believers has existed for a century or more, pouncing upon each new archaeological discovery as proof of Atlantis. Ruins throughout Central and South America have been credited to the Atlantis culture. Everything from Stonehenge in England to the Great Pyramid in Egypt to the monasteries in the Himalayas has been accepted by the believers as further evidence of Atlantis. In Chapter 1 the premise was stated that mankind could be an offshoot of some earlier superculture. The Atlantophiles have recognized this partially and think of Atlantis as that superculture. The psychic world has supported this contention for years by passing along endless messages about the past glories of Atlantis through mediums, Ouija boards, and the like. Many of these messages have served as the basis for some of the peculiar books that have appeared. Surprisingly, some of the data in this torrent of gibberish can be authenticated historically, but a pattern is hard to establish. There are people around the world who claim to have actually met the Atlanteans themselves. These percipients, witnesses, describe stately men and women dressed in colorful robes and headdresses, who appear suddenly like ghosts or apparitions. People who have never given Atlantis any thought at all are suddenly confronted by these entities. Such visits can last for hours according to the percipients. The Atlantean takes great pains to describe the history of Atlantis in detail and when the witness scurries to a library, he or she finds some of the things mentioned in the literature. Eventually the percipient may write a book or pamphlet himself, combining what he has read with what he has been told by the entity. His work is entered into the literature and quoted again and again in new books by others. This same phenomenon occurs constantly in religion, spiritualism, and euphotum. In the latter the entities claim to represent some other planet and they pass along convincing, to the percipient, descript chones of life on other worlds. Like the Atlantean entities, the UFO pilots share the disturbing ability to appear and disappear in thin air. The tall, bearded Atlanteans with their high cheekbones and oriental eyes are undoubtedly close brethren of the picturesque facemen who, incidentally, are most often described the same way. In occult lore these entities have been described for centuries and are called elementals. The phenomenon take many forms and undoubtedly inspired the massive folklore on fairies and leprechauns, vampires, and demons, and the multitude of ghouls, goblins, and banshees who have always occupied our haunted planet. They appear to have the ability to assume any shape or disguise. Some, if not all, seem to be the product of some complicated hallucinatory process which is able to feed false images into the minds of the percipients. Thus, a group of people in a room can sometimes come up with contradictory descriptions of an apparition. Some of the people might not see it at all there are, of course, all kinds of psychological factors which could explain some of these hallucinations and apparitions, 
too. But it is quite remarkable that some of the messages passed along by our elusive Atlanteans are identical to messages passed along to unrelated witnesses who have chatted with spacemen from Ganymede, a satellite of Jupiter. The same mechanism, be it psychic or psychological, is clearly at work in all these cases. The phenomenon utilizes many other frames of reference. An apparition might pose as an ancient Greek philosopher or as Abraham Lincoln or a deceased Pope. There are cases of all these. The folklore of all cultures also takes into account apparitions which pose as exact duplicates of living persons. In Germany, such entities have long been known as doppelgangers. The manifestations have also led to the creation of many minor cults, such as the believers in Lemuria, which is supposed to be another lost continent, and Mu. Here again, we find that a large part of the literature is based upon the alleged experiences of those who have encountered Lororians. In the Middle Ages many people insisted they had visited the underground palaces of the fairies, and volumes were written about the secret commonwealth of the little people. In modern times the Darrow, detrimental robots, myth has blown up around the stories of people who claim they have been taken to the secret caverns occupied by the ancient, secret Darrow culture. In 1944, Amazing Stories, a science fiction magazine, published Richard Shaver's One Remember Lemuria. Editor Ray Palmer was amazed when he was swamped by thousands of letters from people who swore they had experiences with Darrows and Lemurians. They often described things identical to the flying saucer phenomenon, which did not explode on the American scene until 1947. The myth-making machinery of WoW has always been an operation and the earliest thinkers and scientists recognized it. Strange illusions and purposeful distortions of reality have always haunted the human race. Some cults have defined the culprits as masters of illusion, the black mentalists, and the X group. For centuries it was popular to accuse the devil, witches, and warlocks for these bewildering manifestations. Whole religions sprang up around the A do supplied by the phenomenon. In Sweden the great mathematician Emanuel Swedenborg, 1688-1772, wrote huge tomes about his experiences with the elementals and offered solemn warnings such as, when spirits begin to speak with a man, he must be aware that he believe nothing that they say. For nearly everything they say is fabricated by them, and they lie, for if they are permitted to narrate anything, as what heaven is and how things in the heavens are to be understood, they would tell so many lies that a man would be astonished. This they would do with solemn affirmation three greater than wherefore men must beware and not believe them. V. Sir Walter Scott, 1771-1832, the famous novelist, made a serious study of these matters, and in 1830 he published a series of essays summarizing his conclusions. He noted that when trained psychics encountered fairies and visited their splendid palaces the illusion vanished. He explained, S.O.H.B.B. The young knights and beautiful ladies showed themselves as wrinkled carless and odious hags, the stately halls were turned into miserable damp caverns, all the delights of the elfin Elysium vanished at once. In a word, their pleasures were showy but totally unsubstantial, their activity unceasing, but fruitless and unavailing, and their condemnation appears to have consisted in the necessity of maintaining the appearance of industry or enjoyment, though their toil was fruitless and their pleasures shadowy and unsubstantial. Hence poets have designed them as the crew that never rest, Besides the unceasing and useless bustle in which these spirits seem to live, they had propensities unfavorable and distressing to mortals. Educated theologians and scholars attached to the Vatican made a sober investigation into the burgeoning fad of spiritualism in the 1850s. This examination led to the issuance of a papal bull which warned Catholics that spiritualism was dangerous and the work of the devil. Despite all these warnings, Millions of people were gripped in the hopeful effort to communicate with the spirit world, mid the elementals played the game with relish, implanting a whole new lore about life on other worlds or planets. New cults were spawned and dozens of frames of references were established, all based entirely on the seemingly sincere messages of these characters. We were guided from beliefs in fairies and their secret commonwealth to new, more scientific beliefs in interplanetary visitors and their great intergalactic councils. The flying saucer phenomenon generated a whole new set of theories and beliefs as more and more people had encounters with Venusians and Martians in the back hills of Kentucky and the deserts of Arizona. The crew that never rest were up to their old tricks in a new guise. 
Once the skilled investigator recognizes just how intangible the manifestations really are, he is catapulted into the more esoteric world of philosophy. He struggles with the task of interpreting these unreal events, trying to understand their hidden purposes. This is unfortunately the route to madness. The phenomenon is fond of creating allegorical situations which cannot be interpreted without excessive scholarship. The problem is to sort out the meaningful from the rubbish and to search for the hidden consistencies buried in the mountains of communications from the past and present. The scriptures of all the great religions do contain a number of subtle correlations. Much of this literature deals vaguely with rumors of some great past civilization. Isolated Indian tribes in North and South America have legends and myths very similar to the stories found in the Bible, including tales of a great deluge which destroyed most of mankind thousands of years ago. The Toltec Indians, for example, even had a tradition about a Zakwali, a very high tower they erected, and according to Ixtuxochitl, presently their languages were confused, and, not being able to understand each other, they went to different parts of the earth. Atlantean scholars have labored to assemble all the lore as further proof that Atlantis did indeed exist as a real continent, which was destroyed by some great natural catastrophe. However, much of the information passed along by the Atlantean elemental states that Atlantis was an evil place, dominated by a warlike technology very similar to our own, and that the Atlanteans eventually destroyed themselves, or were deliberately destroyed by some greater force which took a dim view of their militarism. In flying saucer lore we have tales passed on by the spacemen of a great planet located between Mars and Jupiter and identified Vari Esli as Maldic, Clarion, and a dozen other names. The inhabitants of this planet learned to smash the atom and soon succeeded in smashing their entire planet. It was broken into thousands of bits and pieces and those fragments now constitute the asteroid belt. So, one important thread runs through all this literature, a great civilization once existed prior to the appearance of modem man, and it was either destroyed or destroyed itself. The surviving physical evidence, which will be discussed further on, indicates that such a civilization did exist on this planet and that its inhabitants vanished before, or soon after, man crawled out of his caves. It may be that the elementals are actually a part of the human psyche and that they have been presenting us with some scrambled racial memory of the distant past. Like the Garden of Eden, Atlantis may be nothing more than an allegory designed to give us a do about our own history. In Flying Saucer lore there is elaborately detailed literature asserting that Venus was actually the Garden of Eden and that Adam and Eve were Venusians planted here to colonize Earth. Another variation on the Noah's Ark theme. Even more interesting are the contiguous activities of the para-human group which has remained in constant touch with us throughout history and has greatly influenced our theological and philosophical ideas. They are proven liars and mischief makers, but it is also possible that they have been slyly trying to tell us something about ourselves. In recent years the flying saucer occupants have passed along innumerable warnings about Bo we have been upsetting the balance of the universe without atom bombs. They have laced these warnings with blood-curdling tales about Maldic. A controversial UFO report from Mendoza, Argentina, is rather typical of these warnings. On September 1, 1968, Carlos Pecanetti, 26, and Fernando Jos Sixbiegas, 29, were driving home from their job at the Mendoza Casino at 3.30 a.m., when their car suddenly stalled. They got out to look under the hood and discovered a huge circular machine hovering nearby. Three beings in coveralls appeared, they said, and they found they were paralyzed, unable to move. A foreign-sounding voice rang in their heads. It was as though they had put into out ears the tiny earplug speakers used with transistors, Pecanetti said. We have just made three journeys around the sun, the voice told them, studying customs and languages of the inhabitants of the system. Mathematics is the universal language. Then a circular screen, similar to a television screen, appeared next to the object, and the two men were treated to a series of images. The first was a waterfall in lush country, the second, a mushroom-shaped cloud, the third, the waterfall seen again but without water. After the entities clambered into the machine and flew off, the two witnesses were able to move again. Their story contains all the familiar ingredients of thousands of other UFO contact tales. First, their automobile stalled, 
then they were paralyzed, next they heard a telepathic voice, and finally they were given a simplified message, and the meaning of that message is quite obvious. Police officers, doctors, lawyers, college professors, government officials, and just plain folks by the thousands have shared similar experiences in recent years. The members of WOW have really been engaged in an all-out effort to convince us of some impending disaster. It is not unusual that they should relate their warnings with tales about past civilizations that followed the same woeful path. The Atlantis story seems to acquire another meaning in view of all this. Atlantis could be a part of our future instead of our past. Perhaps we are the Atlanteans. This is the end of part one. Our Haunted Planet. A book by John Akeel. Please proceed to chapter three before YouTube deletes it. Be sure to subscribe to our channel for more intriguing details of our existence.